Well, happy Resurrection Sunday. We're so glad you're here with us today. It's going to be a great, great service with here with everybody here today. You know, this is one of the greatest miracles, if not the greatest miracle to ever happen on the history of this planet was the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there is more factual proof about the resurrection of Jesus Christ than any historical fact in Roman history. Do you know that? It is such a powerful, overwhelming evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. He died for our sins on the cross on Calvary, and three days later, he got back up from the grave, defeating death, conquering sin, conquering death in your life. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So who's happy to be here on Resurrection Sunday? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, my name is Matthew. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, I would love to at the end of service. But you can go ahead, greet a neighbor, take a seat. We're about to get into communion right now. Happy Resurrection Day. If you need a communion cup, a celebration element, you can raise your hand and one will be brought to you. One time when I was in Greece, on Resurrection Day, the whole island greets each other like this. When they see somebody, they say, Happy Resurrection. They say, He is risen. And then the person responds, He is risen indeed. Why don't we practice that? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we celebrate communion, honoring the Lord's death every Sunday. It's something we should celebrate every day. But do you know that something in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, it says, had it not been for the resurrection, that the cross would be in vain. When I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh. We, and it's wonderful. We do focus on the death and the way he suffered for us. But you know that it would have no value, no power. Nobody could even get saved had he not risen from the dead. You know, the stone was rolled away, not for him to get out, but for people to see that it was an empty grave. We have the only Savior, the only God, with an empty grave. That is something we can celebrate. And it's and he will never die again. In Revelations, he says, I am the one that was dead, but now I'm alive forever. And he's the first one to rise from the dead like that. And then we are going to rise from the dead, and we're going to be like him. There's another verse in the Bible that when Jesus said it's finished, that there was a great earthquake and the dead in Christ, all their graves, they were open. But you know what? They didn't rise from the dead until he rose from the dead. And you know what they did? That was so awesome because they went preaching the gospel that he's the Messiah and this is what was done for you. Can you imagine you get a knock on the door and maybe you lost a child you know, a family member, and it's them. And it could be years that they've been dead, and they're like, hey, you're like, whoa. You know, you're, you're the same age as your mom or your child. There's like, oh my gosh, my child's at the door. And they're preaching the resurrection. Have you guys ever thought about that? I was pondering that, and I was like, wow, can you imagine how awesome that is? That his resurrection resurrected all these people. Now, even though that they died, they will be raised to life and we will live with him forever and ever and ever. And that's the good news. The resurrection of the Lord. Amen. We're going to go ahead and celebrate. I love, I love that we do this every week, but it's something that I ponder every day and just thank him. So important to wake up thankful because whatever is dominating your life whatever thoughts you're going to get more of you ever notice thankful people or people that are always smiling like connie and ram are always smiling always and i'm like wow and that's infectious and unfortunately the opposite is too and we get to choose every day which influence we want to be and i want to encourage you guys based on what the lord has done for us there's nothing, there's nothing that we can't overcome in him. Amen. I was talking to Bernadette today and I was thinking, man, it's just so awesome. If we can think no matter what happens, no matter what upset or disappointment to right away reset and say, oh, but the word says, 
that the righteous fear no bad news, their heart is steady, trusting in the Lord, and that God can work out everything to my benefit, so much so you don't even know if it was the enemy that caused the block or the Lord, because it turns out so good on the other side that you're like, man, I'm glad it didn't work out that way, because this is so much better. You guys, if you keep that mindset, that's what's gonna manifest in your life. Amen. So let's go ahead and celebrate what the Lord has done for us, His love. If there's anything you need in your body, if you have any pain, any sickness, let me tell you, you don't have to live with that because Jesus died with that in His body to set us free. Amen. Any addictions, anybody watching online, anything that you need, you can have it right here. And right now, it's already been paid for. It's already yours. You've already got it. Let's go ahead and partake. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing bodies, for setting people free. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Not will be, is right now. I know these cups are a little bit harder. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> and the blood that cleanses our conscience from all sin, all offenses. They were done by us. They've been done against us. We celebrate that freedom. Mm, come on, you guys. You got to go to the gym. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lord. We, in a sense, we toast to you and your love. It is finished, Lord. We just thank you. I want to say real quick before, you know, and if you drink, it's okay. It's all right. Some of you are doing it like you're doing a shot, but hey, that's all right. <laughs> you know, when he said it is finished, even though it took the resurrection, you have to think about that portion of his work was finished. It was perfect. It was complete. Now the next phase was ascending into hell, bringing up those people that were in paradise. And then the next phase was showing himself. Amen. All of it is so important, you guys. Everything he did. Now, if you got your cup open, we'll go ahead and drink. <laughs> Ah, thank you for a clear conscience, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mary. Oh, isn't that grape juice pretty good, though? It's better than the old ones. You know, although they're a little harder to open, if you looked at the, at the cover of it, it said Miracle Meal. The Miracle Meal. And I love, I love that it's branded that way, the Miracle Meal, because it's the only meal, if you weren't there on Friday for our Good Friday service, you didn't hear how this meal is actually a miracle. You didn't get to hear how we can actually eat our life, eat our, our life literally to health, eat our way to life and health in our bodies. And so through the Holy Communion, is that, that's how we access this healing. There's power in the Holy Communion. It's more than just bread and, and, and a cup. It's, it's symbolic. It's symbolic of what happened on the cross 2,000 years ago by our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if He would have stayed on the cross, like Mary said, if, we were, if, if, if we, he would have stayed on the cross and died and went into the grave and never rose from the dead, the scripture says that our preaching is in vain. Our faith would be in vain. But he got up. He got out of that grave. He walked out. And I love that she said that the tomb rolled away, not for him to get out, because he could have just ascended. He could have just left. It, got, it, it rolled away because there was proof. There had to be proof that he actually got out. And I love this story so much. I love the, the story of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's such a good, good weekend. I'm so happy you guys are all here and uh, celebrating with us. It's going to be a good, good Sunday. Amen. You believe that? You expecting good things to happen today? Good, 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 good. Well, hey, it's offering time. And uh, there's one person excited. Can I get another one? Can I get another one over here? Let's see. Uh, $1, $2, Sold. In 1 Thessalonians, I want to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. You know, not everything that we talk about on our offering portion of the service will actually be about money. Did you know you can prosper in your life without money? Did you know that? And did you know you can prosper with money 
without me preaching about money. And we talk about money a lot. Why? Because money is probably the most important thing in a lot of people's lives. You work nine to five, eight to five, maybe 40 hours a week, maybe 60 hours a week. Who knows? Why? For money. You live on money. You live off of money. Money is all around us all the time. And so we stress how you should have a relationship with money and how to have a healthy relationship with what the Lord's given you. But today, I'm not even going to talk about money, but yet you'll still be able to prosper in finances because the word is true when it's applied to your life in all areas. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writes this and he says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. In other words, you guys are so loving to each other. You don't need me to tell you this. I'm preaching to the choir at this point. He says that there is no need that I should write to you for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so towards all the brethren who are all in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. That you also aspire, here's this one, to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. That you may rock, walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. At any point did I say, give an offering and you will lack nothing in that scripture? No. You can prosper in every area of your life without even discussing a dollar. Do you know that? And it all stems down to one principle that Paul's talking about here. Walk in brotherly love towards each other. Walk in love with one another. And we've been studying the book of Acts lately, and we've been seeing how these people were all in, in unity. They, were, they had all things in common, it said, and they lacked nothing. There was this love that they had between each other. When someone had a need, that need was met by somebody else. When that person had a need, then that, that need was met by somebody else. There was this continuous just giving that people were doing within the body of Christ in the early church. Why? Love. This brotherly love. And I love this because right after he talks about loving people, he says, I urge you that you aspire to lead a quiet life. A quiet life. Not a loud life. Not an annoying life. Not a, 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 an ugly life. A quiet life. And how do you lead a quiet life? Well, he goes on to say, mind your own business. Mind your own business. I think I talked about this last week, if not a couple weeks ago. But a lot of the times, we start judging people and their actions and, and what's happening based off of one thing, a headline. We see a headline. This person did this. And then we tell everybody about it. Oh, did you hear about this person? Did you see what they did? Did you hear this and that? And we begin to cast judgment. But what did Jesus say? He says, judge not, and you won't be judged. Condemn not, and you won't be condemned. Give blank, and it shall be given back to you. And right here, we're seeing another example of this. I urge you to lead a quiet life, minding your own business. Now, am I, to, am I here to say that we're not supposed to help each other when we see each other stumbling? I'm not saying that. This all has to do with brotherly love. This love we have for one another. Is it love, let me ask you, is it love when you see a brother or sister who's falling or who's stumbling in the faith and then you call them out to make an example out of them? Is that love? No. But love is approaching them. Love is telling them, hey, I noticed you're, this is happening in your life. How can I help? I noticed that you're going through this. How can I help you? How can I steer you back on the right path? Now, there are certainly 
disciplinary actions that we can take in the church that Jesus even says, but this all circles about one thing, love, brotherly and sisterly love towards one another. You know, it's unfortunate because I was talking to somebody the other day who is now an atheist, not because of what I said, thank God, but they had gone to the church for a while, trying to discover who they are, wrestling with a lot of thoughts about their self-identity, went off and did their own thing for a while, and they renounced their faith, became an atheist, and uh, their whole lifestyle changed. They turned to transgenderism, bisexuality. And I was talking to them, and they said that the people who drove me out of the church were the people in the church. They were the religious people that were in the church. They drove me out. And I didn't know too much about this person. I, didn't, I don't know their history. I don't know their, their character. I don't know who they were. Because you can have two people in that same experience um, that you're talking to. You can have somebody who's genuinely trying to figure out who's God, what they, what they play a role in in life. And they're genuinely trying to figure it out. And then you have these dumb religious people who are just pointing fingers, casting stones, telling them that they're not good enough. And it leads them away from the Lord. But you also have the people who are easily offended, who say, well, this is just how I feel I am, and no one can change this about me, and and anybody who says different, bye, I'm out of here. And I couldn't tell which one this was, but it got me thinking that there are a lot of religious people in the church that have caused many people to fall away, to not want to be associated Now, the truth is, these people are all responsible for their own actions, whether they stay in the church or they choose to leave. But we as a church, we have a responsibility. We have a role. And it's to show brotherly love. And did you not read what he just said? He says, mind your own business, work with your own hands as we command you that you may walk properly towards those who are outside to those people who don't identify as a child of God so that you can walk properly and people who don't know the Lord can see the way you act, the way you are with that love. And with this love, he says, it'll lead to a life where you lack nothing. You lack nothing. And we've been in a series of of grace and we we were talking about last week, favor because of faithfulness. How your faithfulness will develop favor into your life. And this uncommon kindness you display to other people will start to develop more favor into your life. And I can guarantee you that love, love attached to all those other things will start bringing favor into your life. It'll start bringing favor into the lives of others. People are gonna start looking to you and liking you. That's what it's all about that love to be on display towards others. Now I want to ask you this. I want you to fill in the blank after I've said this sentence, just whatever your mind goes to. But a prosperous person is someone who has a lot of blank. And I'm sure a lot of you Whether you're watching online or here in person, a lot of you thought money. A prosperous person is somebody who has a lot of dough, a lot of cash, right? But the scripture says that a prosperous person is someone who has a lot of peace, a lot of peace, a lot of quiet. Stephanie and I, we've have lived our life pretty quietly for the past two years. And it's been a a, a change for me. I grew up in a household that was loud and in a good way. Sorry, Dad. But I grew up in a household that was, there's always noise. There was always someone banging on pots, cooking some food, doing something, mowing the lawn, whatever it was. There was a lot of noise. And that's what I was used to. Steffi and I get married. And we enter into our house, just the two of us. And then we stole my sister's dog. So then there was three of us. 
And then we got another dog. And then there was four of us. Now we have six animals in the house. And the two of us. Yet our house is so quiet, so peaceful. It's, it's like our little cave that no noise can penetrate. And I love, I come, I've come to love my home so, so much because of how peaceful and how quiet it is. And I've noticed too when in a house that, that is chaotic, in a house that has no boundaries, that has a lot of loudness and a lot of children running around, a lot of incidents and accidents start to happen, right? And I think just maybe it's because the house just got a little too loud. But when you bring down the volume, when you reestablish that peace in the house, there's less and less of those accidents. There's structure beginning to form again. And that's how we're supposed to live our lives with this peace, with this quietness about us. Not to stir the pot with people, not to make people angry at us, not to people look at the church and go, I hate that church because of what they said and what they did. Now, there's going to be things that we say and do that's true. People aren't just going to like it. That's just the fact. But as long as we can, as long as we can show love to people, let us do it good with brotherly love, not casting judgment, not casting stones, not casting anything that could make people feel condemned or guilty because that is not our position. We are not the judges. Amen. We're the lovers of Jesus. I want to go ahead and look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 with you. And Paul writes to Timothy, he says the same the same concept. Therefore I exert first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for all kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peace, peaceable life in all godliness and in all reverence. Did you see that? You know, you start to turn up the volume in your life when you start to get in other people's business. When you start to gossip about people and, and, and try to figure out certain things, the volume starts to turn up in your life and it becomes unpeaceful. And again, Paul is telling us to lead a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. But notice what he says. His prayer leads you into a quiet and peaceable life. When you're in prayer with the Lord, when you're focusing on Him, when you're exhorting Him, when you're, when you're extolling His goodness, that peace will begin to manifest through prayer. And when you're praying, you can't complain about other people. When you're praying, you can't complain about the circumstance. That's not prayer. That's complaining. Prayer is simply talking to God showing how glorious he is, telling him how good he's been, and, and remembering all the things he's done for you. That's prayer. And then he says, pray for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, aka people in political positions of power. I don't care who you are, I don't care what you believe. I don't care if you're Democratic or if you're Republican. I don't care what you are. If you're conservative, if you're a liberal. The Bible tells you to pray for those in political places of power. Now, I don't agree with a lot of things that's happening. And you shouldn't either. I don't agree with certain things happening in, in our government. But what, what good is going to come out of you complaining again? What good is going to come out of you sharing a video on Facebook about our president? What good is going to come out of you mocking somebody? Amen? It's getting quiet in this Methodist church. <laughs> We're instructed to pray. And the moment we start meddling in other people's business, you can, get, you can guarantee that peace just shoot out the door. Because guess why? Peace does not want to cooperate with your gossip. Peace does not want to be associated with your judgment. 
Peace says, you start talking about other people, peace out, I'm gone. And that's how you should react too to other people. You start hearing people talking about this person. Oh, did you hear what they did? What do you think about this person doing that? You know what your response is? <laughs> I don't think. I didn't think about that. That's not on my mind. And the moment people start gossiping around you, you know what you're supposed to do? Bye. I'm going to go over here where there's peace. I'm going to go over here where it's quiet. I'm going to go over here where my life is prospering. Amen? You want to prosper today? You want to prosper for the rest of your life? Lead a peaceable, quiet life. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Well, you, there's a couple ways you can give this morning. You can give on our website if you're watching online at deeperedmi.net slash give. You can also give in person here today as well on your phone. You can text the word give to 833-750-1750 if you'd like. Or you can write cash or check notes here to the ministry as the offering bucket gets passed in just a moment. But before we give, I want to share with you just a little tiny piece of exciting news that I promised to share with you guys uh, earlier this week. Those of you who know... If you've been with us for a while, who was around for Vision Sunday? Big Vision Sunday. Let me see your hands. So we, during Big Vision Sunday, we had all of our congregation write a list of things that they were believing God for in this next year. And we've seen things in our personal life already take place. But we've been seeing things in our ministry that the ministry's vision list that we wrote down, the, those things are slowly but surely getting checked off that list. Glory to God. And we know, we told you guys this about, um, we were wanting to, to make this vision list so that you can see how God's faithful in the ministry. Because if he's faithful in the ministry, he's also faithful in your life. If he can do it for us, he can do it for you. Amen. And one of the things that was checked off was to complete our phase two projects. And that was completed about a month ago about. Just, a, just about a month ago, we've completed that phase two, raising $10,000, so replenishing the, our funds in the, in the account. And that was done all by the glory of God within a, a couple of weeks. It was from 50% to 100%. It was such an, a miraculous thing. But another thing just got crossed off, two things actually, just got crossed off our vision list. And who can remember with me that on our vision list, we had written down expansion of the ministry's property. You guys remember that one? Yes. Well, today on Resurrection Sunday, I want to submit to you that as of today, as of this last week, we have completed a deal and we are now moving in to our brand new church facility, Deep Rooted Ministries. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So there she is. There's the, the beautiful house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful display of God's goodness. This building is way bigger than this one. And it's not a single room like this one is either. It's an actual church building, not a retail store in between a massage parlor and whatever else these guys do. Who knows? It's an actual church building. And it has a beautiful courtyard, a beautiful place for us to gather and have fellowship in. And I want to show you some of the interior pictures. These are mock-ups. This is what the sanctuary will look like by the time we are done making it our home. So that's number one on the vision list. But number two... We got some church chairs for you guys. Remember that one? So say goodbye to Costco fold-up chairs and say hello to Cushion Church chairs. So this is just our, these are just renderings of what the church will look like. This is the sanctuary. It has a separate lobby. It has separate bathrooms that are way more better than these ones. It has rooms for children's facilities. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And we can't wait to share with you when we are actually moving in and having our first service. But it'll be real, real soon. Amen? Is God good? God is good. Yes, He is. Thank you, Lord. So if you want to give this morning, you can do so. We, we already went through all of that. But if you have your offering ready, go ahead and stand with us as we give to the Lord. I want to bless it this morning. The Lord's been faithful, faithful, faithful. So Father God, we just thank you this morning for every gift. 
We thank you for every giver, Lord. We call this seed blessed in Jesus' name, that whatever they set their hands to do will prosper, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for everything you've done in the ministry. We thank you for showing us your favor, showing us your kindness, showing us your goodness, Lord. And we're going to make this new building, we're going to make this new, ch a new church, Father, a beacon, Lord. A place where all people can come in, where the hope of the world is here in Visalia. People can come around from all over the county, all over the city, Father, the surrounding areas. And they find hope, they find restoration, they find love, they find Jesus. And we just thank you for giving us this opportunity, Lord, by your grace and by your faithfulness. And we call you faithful to finish the work you've completed or started in this life and in the lives of every person giving this morning. We love you, Jesus. We praise you. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, let's, let's confess this all together like we believe it. Something good will happen today because he is good and his mercy endures forever. I will have abundance all sufficiency and more than enough because he is good and his mercy endures forever he is my shepherd i shall not want because he is good and his mercy endures forever goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life because he is good and his mercy endures forever give the lord a hand clap of praise this morning offering can get past wasn't that such good news an offering time and we're just so ready we're ready to enter into this new season and we believe that it'll be a season of of a growth spurt and we're going to see more people filling up this room little by little but it's going to happen it's for the lord it is the lord's will for us to prosper and so that's what we're doing and that is what we are doing and it's just fell apart so or it, it came together not fell apart it came together so perfectly so smoothly and it was nothing but favor that has come upon our ministry in this time we've been preaching about favor right for the past few weeks and when we had told you that this church is a church that's going to be growing into favor Amen. favor with god and favor with men and we believe that those two are happening right now um, if i could tell you the whole story i would but we've just been seeing favor after favor after favor with men and all the things that have been happening with the deal here with this ministry. So just keep praying for us. Pray that everything else closes good. We still have this property to take care of. We got to find someone else to come in and then uh, the Lord will take care of the rest. But just keep praying with us that you'll believe for favor in this ministry's life and everything will get taken care of quickly. Amen? Amen. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 16. But before we do so, I want you guys to give a big, big round of applause to all of those watching online, all of our online viewers. Give it up for them. We welcome you. We're so glad you're joining us today. If you ever want to come down to our service, we'll make you feel like you're right at home. So Mark chapter 16, we're going to take a break from the series we've been talking about with Mega Grace. We're going to take a little break from that, and we're going to talk about, obviously, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the scripture says in Mark chapter 16, verse 1, Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they had looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, but is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter. Don't forget Peter now. Go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. Let's stop there. These people 
Mary, Mary, and Salome were all coming to anoint this dead body. And man, when they got there, they were surprised. They, they were expecting something dead. They were looking for Jesus in a dead place. And when they had got to the tomb, they were instantly greeted with an angel. And this angel was sitting on the, the place where Jesus was laid. And he said, he is not here. He is risen. And man, I can guarantee you that was the best news that anybody has ever heard since that day. That is the greatest news, in fact, that you are about to hear today, that he is not there. He is risen. Amen? He is no longer on this earth. He's no longer in the tomb. In fact, if you go to Buddha's tomb, guess what you'll find? Buddha. If you go to Muhammad's tomb, guess what you'll find? Muhammad. If you go to anybody else's tomb, you will find that person. But if you go to Jesus Christ's tomb, you will not find a body. Amen? Because he's gone. He's risen, and now he's in heaven, seated in heavenly places with the Father at the right hand of God. And he's called us to come sit up there with him. Thank you, Lord. You know, in Luke chapter 24, with the same account, when the angel talks to them and he says, He's not here, and they're seeking among the dead. In Luke, he actually says, why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is alive. And he says, why do you seek the living among the dead? There's a lot of people who are curious in life, and they're trying to figure out what is the way? What is the, the, the way to life? What is the way to peace? What's the way to prosperity? And they try to find all these routes, and they think, Maybe Judaism is the way. Maybe Catholicism is the way. Maybe, maybe uh, whatever other religion they're looking at, they think it's the way, but they're asking, they're, they're, they're looking in the wrong places. They're looking in the wrong places, and it's as if we tell them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for Jesus in a different place? You see, they might not actually be looking for Jesus Christ, but they're looking for a version of him. They're looking for another example of him, and they're trying to find all of these, these vices. They're trying to find all of these things in their life to satisfy the need for Jesus. But the question is, why are you looking for the living among the dead? All other ways, all other religions, all other things, other methods, other forms of meditation, all other things in life that do not involve Jesus are dead. They are dead. But people are still looking for the living in the dead. There is this hunger in people's lives to find this life that Jesus gave us. People everywhere are looking for this life that's called the eternal life that only Jesus can give. And they're looking for Jesus in all of the wrong places. They're going to the bars and they're trying to satisfy themselves by getting drunk and by not remembering their past. They're trying to find all these other ways to get life in dead places. But there is only one place, only one place that the living belong. And it's not with the dead. Amen? It's with us in heaven. It's with us where we will live forever in paradise. It's with, with, in this life, the scripture says, that we can experience things now in this life and in the life to come. This living water that Jesus came to give us. If we continue, it says in verse 9, well, in verse 8, they said, so they went out quickly. And they fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. But then Mary encounters Jesus. And in verse 9, it says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, let me inspire you really quick. If Jesus got up early in the morning, you can too. If Jesus was an early riser, you can be an early riser too. A fun fact about myself. You guys learn about me more than I even know about myself. The Lord just makes me say these things. <laughs> a fun fact about me, when I was 
growing up, as probably any high schooler, young adult person does, I would sleep in about 12 o'clock. And I would just sleep my whole day away, and I'd wake up at noontime and think my whole day is gone, and I would just live the rest of that day, but then I'd go to bed late to make up for all the time that I spent sleeping. But I was not an early riser. You could not get me to wake up early for nothing. Church was about it, and school was about it. But you, I, if it were up to me, I would sleep in all the way till noon. What a life is that, huh? Man, and I, let me just tell you, marriage just makes everything better. Because when I got married to her, guess what time I started waking up at? Six o'clock on the dot every single day. And now I've kind of got a little lazy with it. I'll turn my alarm off and I'll maybe get up at 6.30 on a good day. But I've learned and I've trained myself to start waking up early. And I love waking up early. I get disappointed when I'm, when I'm, when I sleep in a little longer to about seven, I, I'm, I get frustrated because I just lost an hour of my day. And I, I wake up at six and I feel great because I have all day long. And you know what's the great thing about being kind of self-employed, I guess? I can work whenever I want to. And so usually when I wake up, I start working at like 6.30 and then I'm done by 12.30 or one because I spent all morning working and now I have the rest of the day to hang out with my wife. It's a great thing. But I learned to rise early, to get up early, just like Jesus did. So you can too. So if anybody needs that encouragement today, if you can't get up early in the morning, that's a word for you. That the Lord did it, so you can do it too. Amen? Amen. But there's also another importance about this early rising. And David, in fact, says it in the Psalms. He says, God, you are my God. Early, I will seek thee. And it can certainly mean early in the morning, I will seek you. The first thing that I do in the morning, I will be with you. I will seek you. I will be in your word. I will be in prayer. I will be with you. I will seek you early in the morning. But it also can mean something else. I mean, early is always better than late. Right? Can we agree on that? Yeah. Early is always better than late. Except maybe for like one or two instances. But early is, is better. And early can mean I will seek you early before my problem arises. Before I encounter something that I don't want to go through, I will seek you before. Because we have a lot of Christians who are seeking God only when problems come. But imagine, what would your life look like if a problem did come from the enemy, but you've been with the Lord early? You were with him before, way before the problem arose in your life, and you were with him early. You were seeking him early. Early just simply means priority. It's a priority in your life, whether that be the first thing you do in the morning or the first thing you do just in your life. You sought the Lord early. And so when things come in your life, you're prepared. Be a much better life, a much more fulfilled life. Amen? Amen? So it says, when he rose early on the first day of the week, you see how distracted I can get just from that one sentence? <laughs> he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast out seven demons. She went and told those, uh, told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. So then when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Man, these are the people that walked with Jesus, that talked with him, that saw him raise Lazarus from the, from the dead. Yet they did not believe. They did not believe what Mary had said. You know, mourning was the only response to death. Mourning was the only response to death. That's all that they knew. Amen? Thank you, Lord. That is all that they knew because no one had ever died and rose again. No one had ever died on a cross. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He was the first to die being hung on a cross on display to be taken off the cross, wrapped in some garments, put into a tomb. And get up three days later. Mm. Thank you, Lord. And you got to give his disciples some grace. i never seen this before. Never seen this before. But yet he still urged Mary to go tell him. Tell him what you saw. And I love that he used Mary. The first preacher ever. The first preacher of the resurrection of Jesus. And her sermon was probably the shortest sermon you've ever heard. And you're probably going to be wishing that she's preaching instead of me. (laughs) Because she runs back to her people and all she's saying is, He is risen! He is risen! He is risen! (laughs) And that's it. That was the sermon. And she preached this sermon, and I can just imagine her excitement, this, this, this joy that was rising up inside of her, because she not only heard that Jesus had risen, but she saw. She saw him, and it's funny, because one of the scriptures says that she had thought he was a gardener when he appeared to her. She said, gardener, where did you take his body? But she met Jesus face to face. And she went running back to her people, saying, he is risen. And you would think that his disciples who'd been walking with him for three years were to go, no way, you saw him? Where is he? Take us to him. But what do they do? I don't believe you. Who are you? Are you possessed again? And they don't believe her. They doubt. And they struggle in believing in the resurrection. You know, the resurrection, without the resurrection, everything that we preach, everything that we do would be 100% void. Everything we believe would be in vain. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, but if there's no resurrection, we read it earlier, of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ isn't risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. You know what a false witness is? A liar. If there's no resurrection, we are liars because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. But for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your faith is futile and you're still in sin. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, for of all men, the most is pitiable, pitiable, pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's saying if, if, if he never rose from the dead, everything we did is in vain. Church, if he didn't rise from the dead, there'd be no purpose in us meeting here today. There'd be no purpose in coming to church ever again. There'd be no purpose. This life would be meaningless. But that's not what happened. He rose from the dead. And now we're here together today, 2,000 years later, witnessing to people, saying, he is risen, still sharing the shortest message ever to be recorded on the history of the planet, he is risen. And we are still shouting that today. That is the gospel. Without the resurrection, the gospel is dead. Without the resurrection, the gospel has no power. We need the resurrection. That is the whole belief of Christianity. What do you believe in? What what is your belief? What's your faith in? Is it that you can just be healed? Is it that you can just prosper? If it's those things, but it doesn't follow or come after the resurrection, 
It's vain. It is vain. But thanks be to God because he rose from the dead. He defeated sin and death. And now through that, through that miraculous thing that he did, we can now preach this with boldness. And we can now live this in power. Amen? Amen. Because he rose from the dead. Thank you, Lord. Your faith is not secure without belief in the resurrection. Your faith isn't secure without the actual resurrection occurring. We needed that resurrection. I, we needed it. Like it was, we needed the resurrection to actually happen. Going back to Mark chapter 16. In verse 12, he says, After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. So this is an image that of Jesus now walking and talking with two more people. And if you're familiar with the story, that there's these people who are on a, on a road to this place called Emmaus, and he's talking with them, and, and they're, they're not joyful. They're mourning as well because someone had just passed away that they loved. Jesus Christ, the one who came to conquer sin and death, has died. And now there's just this mourning. And this mourning, that's all that they were used to. This mourning is what they defaulted to. And he tells them, don't you know? Don't you know what had happened? Don't you know about the news that's taken place? And the scripture says, by the time they had finished their journey, he broke bread with them. And then they realized who he was, and he vanished. He vanished. And they finally understood that it was Jesus that they were walking with. And it says they went and told everybody about it, but guess what? They didn't believe it either. They still had doubts. They had their arms crossed and said, prove it to me. Show me proof. And there was doubts. And in verse 15, well, before we go there, actually, in verse 14, he says, Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked them. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Can you imagine the, the, his disciples? And there's a reason why they were called the disciples, right? I mean, he, here he is for three years telling them, the Son of Man will die and rise from the dead. The Son of Man will do this. He'll be buried in the ground. Three days later, he'll come up. The destruction of the temple. And then three days later, it'll be rebuilt. He's telling them about this. Their whole entire ministry, this is going to happen to me, guys. This will happen. And every time he would tell them, they said, well, where are you going? He says, I'm going to a place that you don't know. Well, where is that, Lord? Tell us where it's at so we know. And they don't get it. All the way up to his crucifixion, they still don't get it. They don't understand it. And then here's Jesus appearing, literally walking into the room with a closed door through the wall. And he appears to them. And you can just see the, the disciples sitting there. Maybe they're shocked at first, but I can guarantee you the moment they realized it was Jesus, they'd want to go up to him and hug him. Oh, Jesus, you're alive. And hug him and greet him and be with them. But what are they greeted with? I rebuke you. You did not believe. I rebuke you. And this rebuke was a hard rebuke. It wasn't just, guys, come on, man. Why didn't you believe? No. This is all that Christianity is about. And they did not believe it. And he rebuked them for their unbelief, and for their hardness of heart. We are called believers. But what is it that we believe in? Right? That is who we are. We are believers. But belief in anything other than the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
It's nothing. I may be so bold to say it's cultish. Believing in something other than, I'm talking about believing in, in, in your favorite sports team to win. Believing in something that causes you life. Believing in anything else that, that, that causes you to have abundance, to have prosperity, to have peace. Belief in anything else other than the resurrection of Jesus is vain. It's vain. All roads do not lead to Jesus. All roads don't go to heaven. One does. Only one does. Now, you might find Jesus in your life venturing down a wrong road, but guess what? That's as far as you will get. You won't get past him. It's only through him you can go to the Father. Amen. Only through him. And the moment you discover him, you know what he's going to tell you? Come follow me. Leave that behind. Come follow me. Leave what you're used to behind. Come follow me. Leave that practice behind. Come follow me. And he will lead you to the Father because him and the Father are one. You see, as believers, we cannot be like these disciples and doubt what the word says about him. We need to be quick to believe what he says. The Bible says you want me well, I'm quick to believe it. The Bible says he rose from the dead, I'm quick to believe it. The Bible says that he wants us to have peace, I'm quick to believe it. We've got to be quick to believe. I'm not saying believe everything you hear, but be quick to believe what you hear from the word. Be quick to, what, to believe what you hear from this inspired, anointed word of God. Don't take your time about it. Don't try to contemplate it. Don't try to make it make sense in your mind. That's called the flesh. That's called carnal. And the carnal and the spirit cannot go together. You've got to be quick to it. Believe it quickly. Say, oh, I believe that in Jesus' name. I might not see it right now in my life, but I believe it. I'm quick to believe it. Don't be slow. Do not be slow to believe it. Friends, you don't have... You don't have all the time when you're in the world. Those watching online, some people don't want to come to church because they're comfortable sitting on the couch. Listen to me. You're not going to be able to get fellowship by sitting on the couch. You're not going to be able to dive deeper by sitting on the couch. And people who often are just watching from a distance, people who don't want to be connected to a church, who don't want to come sit in a church, I can guarantee you give them a few years and they will be gone. They will be disconnected entirely. And you don't have forever to wait on. You don't have forever to just sit there and think about life or think about if Jesus is the way. You don't have time. You got to be quick to believe in him, to believe in his resurrection. Thank you, Lord. Now watch what he said right after this. Right after he rebuked those disciples because of the hardness of their heart. Verse 15, he says, in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he says, go into all the world. I don't have it on the screens. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Those who believe what? The resurrection. The resurrection is the power that fuels our belief. The resurrection is the power that fuels our faith to do exactly what Jesus told us to do. That was his commission. And his commission directly followed. Believe. Believe in me that I died for you. I took everything from you, all your sickness, all your pain, all of your mistakes, all of your shortcomings, all the things that you hate about yourself, I took them. Now you go do this. 
you go out into all the world and preach the good news. What's the good news? The good news is the cross. What Jesus did on the cross, but it doesn't stop there. You see, I feel like we just, we block ourselves, man. I feel like as Christians, we limit ourselves because we only stop at he died and rose again. I believe in Jesus. But why did he die? Why did he go to the cross in the first place? He went to the cross to take everything that was evil from us, not just sin and wickedness, but evil in death. He conquered it. That's the significance of believing in the resurrection. And the good news is because of this one instance that Jesus did, you're no longer a sinner. You are righteous in the sight of God. You're no longer a sick person. You are healed in Jesus' name. The Bible says that he came to preach to the poor. Why? So they could be made rich. That's the good news. It doesn't just stop at sins. It follows the whole, the whole pattern of Jesus' ministry here on earth. So what did he say would happen to those who are quick to believe? To be power in their life. We've been talking about Acts for the past few weeks. And what have we been discussing every opening of the sermon? The first four chapters. What happened in Acts chapter 1? Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 3? Acts chapter 4? Well, the beginning of all of those things, Jesus told his disciples to wait here until you receive power from the Holy Spirit so you can be a witness. And their whole ministry, everything that they knew was all witnessing about the resurrection of Jesus. That's what fueled their faith. That was, that's what was able... Oh, friends, this, this resurrection witness, the witness of the resurrection is what enabled them to go to the man who was lame since birth and says, get up right now and walk in Jesus' name. The power of the resurrection's witness, that's what enabled them to have this power. Thank you, Lord. You have to acknowledge the resurrection. And I love the resurrection because it means a little bit more than what we're used to just thinking about. And there's a story in the Bible that has nothing to do with the resurrection on paper, but in, in, in spirit it does. It's in Luke chapter 15. Luke Chapter 15. In the verse 11, Jesus said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of goods that falls to me. You guys are familiar with this passage of scripture. The prodigal son. And he tells his father, give me what is inherently mine. Give, give to me what belongs to me. I don't want to wait for you to pass. Give it to me now. So the father gives him all his inheritance. He divides it. He divides to them his livelihood. Verse 13, not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country. You see, that's important. There's distance. He journeyed. He wasn't on the fence anymore. He went a far distance away from his father, away from his family. And he said, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. And he sent him into fields to feed swine. And he would, be gladly, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him 
anything. But when he came to himself, you see, we don't have the luxury of, of reading the words in scripture that tells us how long this son was gone. But I was talking to Stephanie earlier this morning, just remember, just going over this in my head. And I started thinking, I don't think this, this son was gone for about a week. I don't think this son was gone for a weekend. It wasn't a weekend splurge. He journeyed far away, no contact. And he was given an inheritance. And you know his father was pretty wealthy. He was given an inheritance. And he spent it all. And I believe it kind of looked like this. He had the money. He went off and did his own thing. And then he started splurging here and there. And then he spent a little bit on this and spent a little bit on that. And after about a year, he looks at his account and goes, "Uh uh-oh, I'm a little low. Maybe I should work part-time and see what I can do from there. And as he's working, he keeps spending more. He keeps living this, this lazy life and he keeps spending and spending and spending to the point where years down the road, he has nothing. And during that time of, of trying to make means for himself, he goes all the way below himself to eat with the pigs. I can guarantee you, someone who spent all of their money in one weekend would go running home before he even got a chance to eat with pigs. What had happened here? This time had passed and this pride had grown. Oh, I can do this by myself. I can survive. I'm not going to go back to mommy and daddy. I can survive. And this pride rose up inside of him to cause him to eat with pigs. So much pride that he ate with pigs. But then he says, when he came to the end of himself, when he came to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger. And he says this in verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. What's happening is humility and repentance. Humility and repentance is in this person's heart. He realized I am nothing. Even my father's servants have more than me. So let me go back. Let me humble myself lower than a son. I don't deserve to be a son anymore. And he goes back to the father with this attitude. It says, and when he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. I can just picture this in my mind. The son, you you obviously could tell that he was planning all this in his head. He was reciting it to himself before he went. So this is what I'll say. Surely this will make me come back into his life. And he said, I will say this. I'm no longer worthy. And he comes to his father. And now is his time to say it. And so he begins saying, Father, I am, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer be called worthy and be your son. And I'm sure he had more plan to say. And before he can get any other words out, his father said, no, 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 no. Come here. And he embraced him. And I'm sure the guy's thinking, really, that's it? I had more. I had more to say to prove myself to him. Hey, friends, this is a story of redemption, but it's also a story of resurrection. Because if we go on, He says, put on a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead 
and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. And they began to be merry. This is a story of death and life, a resurrection, just like the story that's being told over thousands of, of airwaves, over thousands of TVs and churches. The story of the resurrection is being told today. But notice what the father does when the son comes. He embraces him. He kisses him. And then he says, bring my best robe. Now in my Bible, it has a footnote where it says bring. And on the footnote, you want to know what it says? Quickly bring. Quick. Bring out the best robe. Quick, get my rings and put them on him. Quick, get sandals onto his feet. Quick, get the, get the meat and let's cook it. Let's have a feast. Quick, because my son has returned to me. And friends, you want to know why it's important for us to believe quickly? To believe quickly in the resurrection? To believe quickly in what Jesus has done for us? Because the quickly, when we quickly believe, God is quickly to forgive. He will quickly forgive all of our stuff that we've done. He will quickly redeem us and bring us into his family when we are quick to believe. Amen? Quickly. Quickly. The father did not look at the son and go, wait, let's, okay, you can come in, but let's go wash you up first. Let's go clean you up a little bit first before we have a meal. Let, let's make sure you're prepared. You look good. Let's make sure that you have everything taken care of first before you come into my house. But he said, quickly, quickly get this robe of righteousness and put it on my child. Get this robe of healing and put it on my son, on my daughter. That is what our father in heaven is telling us. Anybody who has never received Jesus, they don't understand how quickly God is to forgive Thank you, Lord. But notice it didn't take place until the son had come to himself. He realized, I can't do this on my own. I can't live this life by myself. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not my own source. I'm, I'm a horrible source. I can't be my own source. And Jesus even says something similar in Matthew chapter 5. He says, bless it. Blessed are the people who are at the end of their rope. You are more blessed to be at the end of your rope because when you're at the end of your rope, there is less of you and there is more of God. And this son came to the end of his rope. I can't do this anymore, Lord. I can't live my own life anymore, Lord. I'm quick to believe. And every time the father will say, well, I'm quick to forgive. I'm quick to make you righteous. I'm quick to make you a part of my family. And I love that about our Lord. And that's what Jesus was sacrificed for. He was sacrificed for that love. He died on the cross for that love. Isn't God good? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Lastly, I want to go to Romans chapter 10. If I can have the guitar come back up. Romans chapter 10. Thank you, Lord. When we're quick... To believe, God is quick to receive. Amen. He's quick to receive us. Oh, thank you, Lord. And the scripture says this, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. He says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation 
What does this word confession mean? It means to say the same thing as, to agree with what's, with, uh, with what's already been said, to confess. And when you confess the Lord Jesus raised from the dead, you're not making that up in your own self. You don't have the brain power to think of that, to comprehend that. But you're confessing. You're agreeing with what's already been said about Jesus. You're agreeing with his word. And that's all God's asking for people to do. Just agree with what my word says. Agree with what I've said about my son, Jesus. And the scripture also says that as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so you walk in him. So after he says, just confess, just agree Agree with me that my son raised from the dead and saved you. You'll be saved. And then he says, okay, then agree in this too, that I've healed you also. Start confessing healing over your life. Start confessing good things over your life because I've already said them about you. But the first step will always begin with confessing in the Lord Jesus. Confessing that he rose from the dead three days after his crucifixion. This confession we got to be quick, quick to believe it, quick to receive it, quick to say those things out of our mouth, that he has rose from the dead, that he has saved us from death. He has saved us from all the punishment we would ever face in this life. He saved us from all of it because of his love for us. That's confessing it with your mouth. Thank you, Lord. Now, we might be a room full of people who happily confess this, we might be a room full of people. You might be watching this video and, and you might just have this confession already inside of you that yes, I have confessed that yes, I am, but there are still people who have not confessed the Lord Jesus. There are still people who are still questioning. They're still seeking for life in dead places. And all they need to do is quickly confess. Just quickly believe quickly receive Jesus into their heart. And it's as simple as this, friends. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is the gospel of Jesus. That's all it takes. Confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart. We're going to take a moment right now for anybody who's watching online, anybody in the room, I don't know your heart. You might be coming to church for years, but I don't know your heart. If there's anybody in the room or if there's anybody watching online who has yet to make this confession, who has yet to quickly believe, they're skeptical still, they're still putting some blockers in front of their belief. They're still doubting. They're questioning. They're trying to figure out how. My encouragement to you is stop it. Just be quick. Just believe it. And if that's you online or anybody in this room, we read it, right? That's how simple it is to be saved by confession of the mouth and believing in the heart. And so we're going to pray for people right now. If anyone's watching online, if you're in the room, I just want you to say this. You say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again for me. Thank you for taking my sin and thank you for taking my sicknesses. I believe you love me. I believe you want good things for me. I believe you care about me. I confess today that you are the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me in all of my life. Tell me where to go. Tell me what to do. Tell me how to do it, Lord. You have complete control of me. I put my trust in you. I put my faith in you. And I believe you are my Savior. 
In Jesus' name, somebody say amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, if that was you online or anyone in here, that was your first time or maybe your 20th time, I don't know. And frankly, I don't care. But if that was you this morning, I want you to let us know. If you're watching online, please email us at prayer at deeprootedmi.net. We would love to get a hold of you and contact you and share with you what God's been doing. We'll also send you a free gift. If you're not watching, if you're not from the U.S. or from Visalia, we'll send you something free. But if that was anybody in the room, we'd love to pray with you at the end of service, talk to you, meet with you, give you a free book uh, so you can just venture on this, this life with, with Christ a little further, a little deeper, and start something strong with the Lord. Amen? God is good. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Amen? God is so faithful to us. Let us stand this morning as we get dismissed and go on our day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just, we just thank you this morning. We all just thank you. We all give you our, our praise, Lord, our, our, our admiration, Lord, of your goodness, of your, your, your faithfulness in our life, Jesus. We are so grateful and so thankful for what you've done. And Lord, let us not just say things in word, but let us show things in action, how grateful we are for you, how appreciative we are of you, Lord, that the love of you is overflowing out of us into others. Let that be an example to other people who, who are, are far away from you. Today, we're meeting with a lot of people. Today, we're gathering with lots of friends and family, and I pray that you inspire us to be that light to them. They may only celebrate this day with an Easter bunny and an egg, but Father, we believe that we can be a light, Lord. We believe we can show people your goodness, Father. So let that resonate through us as we go throughout our day. Let your love and your goodness and your faithfulness just be on display through every one of these people in this room, Father, and watching online. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for your word today. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in today. Consider subscribing to our YouTube channel so you don't miss out on any other videos that we post here. Also, share this with a friend so that they too can hear the gospel of grace. Don't forget, every Sunday and every Friday you can tune in live with us as we study the word of God together.